The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Today we're asking, how can connected and automated vehicles benefit, the fu benefit future transportation? My name is Neela McCoy, and I'll just be providing some technical support today. But you can also contact me if you've got any webinar-related inquiries. Now joining me in the webinar studio today is our fantastic moderator, Dixon Lau. Dixon is part of the ADVI team here, so welcome, Dixon. Thank you. Now the key thrust of the Australia and New Zealand driverless vehicle initiative is to build momentum by rapidly exploring the impacts and requirements of this new technology. It is a coalition of government, industry and academia striving to bring self-driving vehicles safely to Australian and New Zealand roads. Now, just some housekeeping matters. The webinar today will run for approximately 40 minutes with 10 minutes for questions. And just some go-to webinar functions there. Um, webinars work best when they're interactive, so please feel free to type in any questions that you might have into the questions box. And I've already had a question come in, um, which is who's gonna win the Melbourne Cup? So I'll throw that to our presenters. I think we will answer that question when the horses run autonomously. Ah, oh, fantastic. <laughs> now I'll hand over to Dixon now to welcome our presenters. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Neela, for the introduction. Good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to today's uh, seminar titled How Can Connected and Automated Vehicle Benefit Future Transportation? As mentioned, my name is Dixon Lau, and I'll be your moderator for today. With increasing automated and connected vehicle trials around Australia, this webinar will discuss current research on behavior of driverless vehicles, as well as modeling to investigate cost-effective options. So to share with us uh, with the insights to today's webinar, we have both Professor Stefan Winter and Professor Rocco Zita. Stefan is a professor and discipline leader, geomatics at the Department of Infrastructure Engineering at the University of Melbourne. In the research, he looks at the behavior of driverless vehicles from multiple perspectives, such as interaction, coordination, and demand responsive uh, transportation, such as uh, next generation smart mobility. Rocco Zito is the head of civil engineering at the College of Science and Engineering at Flinders University, South Australia. He will discuss connected and autonomous vehicle and how they have the potential to increase safety, reduce congestion and decrease environmental impacts. In this webinar, he will share autonomous vehicles modeling and trials around Australia. But first, let's invite Professor Stefan Winter to share with us his presentation titled A Conceptual View on the Behaviour of Driverless Vehicles. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you, Dixon, and welcome, everybody. Well, Dixon introduced myself already, um, so we might be short on the first slides. Uh, they were only documenting my background and the history to illustrate a little bit what my, my field of research is. I will talk about the driverless vehicle in uh, in a number of directions that will come clearer in the next slides, but uh, perhaps we should acknowledge that driverless vehicles are not a new phenomenon as such. They are already fading in. Um, we are talking about levels of autonomy and increasing um, increasing capacity of the vehicles to become driverless. Um, we are talking about um, or experiencing driverless vehicles in various environments. Uh, we will not see them for a while in the inner city urban traffic, but we are already um, doing trials in reserved environments, or we may have particular modes, um, trains operating without a driver already in operation for years. So it is a process we are currently witnessing and and perhaps pushing with our own agendas. Now the driverless vehicle comes with some promises, but these promises I would argue are a little bit more complicated than the simple messages. So we expect less, less accidents from autonomous vehicles, driverless vehicles, and that's fine because they are autonomous. That means they trust their sensors and react typically faster than a human driver. They are not affected by um, 
a, a tired driver or a, or a driver under um, the influence of uh, drugs or um, attracted to their mobile phone and Twitter instead of the traffic. So th there is some reason to that. But on the other hand, we don't know the consequences of artificial intelligence that runs our vehicles currently. So maybe we have in the future um, the detection of a, of a bug that um, produces the, the super uh, <laughs> event on our highway. Um, th that remains to be seen. Uh, the promise of less traffic um, has been brought up by novel modes, by shared modes, um, people luring away from using their private vehicle. That remains to be seen as well. If we think of uh, Uber-like driverless vehicles uh, picking up passengers and replacing the private car, then they, these vehicles still have empty cruising time and add actually to the driven kilometers, vehicle kilometers on the road. Another, another argument is less parking demand, um, which is coming from the same argument, less traffic or less vehicles on the road. Um, but then we um, might might see that um, these vehicles also have parking needs, in particular if they um, do need charging stations, they do, do need parking spaces for long times and in um, large numbers, similar large numbers than we have currently. We, we may see or although uh, a reduction of parking pressure at particular locations because the driverless vehicle can move to other places to do what it needs to do. And uh, the last argument for driverless vehicles is cheaper traveling, so less dollars per vehicle kilometer. And that comes from shared ownership, uh, from using electrical power instead of uh, uh, common current fuels. Um, and it comes from, because these vehicles are more safe, from reduced insurance rates. So that might realize um, actually this way. Now, for all these reasons, we are talking about disruptions and dis disruptions make it very hard to make predictions about future states or predictions of human behavior in a world that offers very different options for moving around. And uh, that means there's plenty of scope for doing research on the properties, on the behavior, and um, that leads to some of the research um, I'm doing in my group and research that is done in the other places around Australia. In my own research, I look into conceptual behavior of driverless vehicles. We are interested in <coughs> ways how people interact with a vehicle and in our own group mostly how other people, not the driver, interacts with the vehicle. The driverless vehicle has no driver any longer. So we're talking about pedestrians or bike riders um, interacting with something where there's no driver behind the steering wheel. We may talk or do talk about coordination between vehicles and here we are looking in particular currently into platoon formation, something that is trialed on the roads in a very simplistic fashion, we argue. There's much more to study about coordination of vehicles in that context. And uh, the last aspect, demand responsive transportation. I will talk a little bit about that in my coming slides, but there is more research done in our group on the formal description of these. So that was uh, a list of topics um, of my talk at the summit, and you can take that as a teaser, or the rest you can take as a teaser for my talk at the summit. Here I will concentrate on driverless demand responsive transport. Now, demand responsive transport is actually a spectrum. Uh, from left to right, we have the private car, which is to some extent demand responsive because you use your private car if you need it. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, we have the scheduled forms of transportation. They are to some extent demand responsive, uh, demand responsive because they, they, they operate with higher frequencies when there is higher demand, at least for historic reasons, learned patterns over time, higher demand. 
here I am interested more in the middle space, the space that reacts in an ad hoc fashion on uh, demand that pops up. Um, so systems like shared taxis, like uh, pooled ride sourcing, like um, ad hoc ride sharing, so mo more social or more commercial variations of the same thing. Next slide. So uh, what is then demand responsive transport or, or driverless uh, demand responsive transport in, in this focus? Well, we're looking at the ad hoc situation, at the on-call situation of trans uh, responding to transport demand. <laughs> and of course, there are, there are uh, systems um, that we are used to, which are leading to interesting scenarios when we think about autonomy or driverless vehicles. There are first taxis or dial ride services, minibuses that operate like taxis. You would call them or hail them and they offer service from point to point, from where you are to where you want to go to. There are shuttles. Shuttles are typically accumulating uh, a number of passengers before they leave. Passengers that have different uh, transport or different destinations. So that shuttle starts from a particular location, say an event or an airport, and brings people to their individual destinations. Um, we have social ride sharing where people agree with their neighbors or friends um, to travel together to work or other pre-arranged trips. So that, that requires somebody walking up to the person with a car. The car driver goes to their own destination and then the passenger has to, to walk a little bit. Um, we may have um, included here even the scheduled public transport that I mentioned before with operating with varying frequency, with varying capacity. But here the user, the passenger, has to navigate through a network. All these demand, to some degree, demand responsive forms of transport operate without information and communication technology. They are pre-arranged. Or if they are ad hoc, then they are serendipitous. So it's a, it's a, a show at the, at the corner of the sidewalk and see whether they are lucky. Next slide. So what is new then when we think about driverless vehicles with all these modes, and, and we can operate all these modes with driverless vehicles. Um, first, getting rid of the driver leads to unprecedented cost levels. It becomes much cheaper since the driver is typically the most expensive part of any um, mode of transport. Um, we have connected vehicles. That means the vehicles are connected either to a centralized service provider or um, they are capable to communicate in a decentralized fashion to their neighbors in traffic, which enables real-time planning, um, real-time um, negotiations and making contracts. We have connected the people that are looking for transportation um, through their smartphones, through apps on their smartphones. So what we have said about the vehicles above applies to the people as well. They can express their their transport demand, they can enter negotiations, they can make contracts, they can track where they are, they can pay through their smartphones and so on. Another aspect that is new is location awareness um, and that applies to vehicles, to people and to any other resource that is necessary for the operation of a particular mode and in particular the dynamicity of that resource, um, that, that behavior over time. Is a charging station in use currently or free? Is a parking space used or free? Um, this kind of things in real time. And we have a shared or uh, more, um, accept, more and more accepting uh, the shared economy with new business models. The younger generation thinks of the shared economy increasingly as a smart choice. They are 
fewer people um, in the in the early twenties um, having a driver's license because they organize their mobility nowadays with their smartphones and among friends. Some people talk about peak car in this regard. There are trust and safety issues, of course, with uh, sharing uh, transportation modes. Um, things to encounter that are ratings and, and, and other measures, I should say. This is only an example. And we have to talk about micropayments because the services offered are typically um, for low costs and the um, incentive of using shared economy must be an easy form of payment or a, or a reduction of the transaction costs. Next slide. So th that means there are opportunities for driverless vehicles and demand responsive transport in particular. Um, this definition here is not original and it's even not mine and, and it, there's nothing surprising in this list so I, I will not talk about much uh, much about it but you, you, you see and agree probably that we have different um, forms of modes, um, um, the sharing of rights as an underlying principle. It is all ICT supported and it is uh, focused to, on the user and the user demand. All right, next slide. There are opportunities though for research and implementation from an economic perspective, something that I think we haven't fully understood yet or fully embraced. ICT provides in some sense a multi-sided platform for the driverless vehicle in demand responsive transport. It is a, a matchmaker platform between those that look for a ride or for transport and those that are offering a seat or multiple seats in their vehicles in, in that service environment. Now, the matchmaking is interesting from an economic perspective because it is an interdependent demand. Only if there are enough people looking for transport, there will be drivers joining the platform. And if the drivers don't get um, a, a promise for a return uh, for a an, for an financial incentive then they will go away and join other platforms. If the people that are looking for transport are not getting enough drivers they may stay away and go to competitors. So that, that balance between um, people offering and people looking for transport supply is, is a critical, critical one and not a well understood one. Um, in a world where there are alternatives. The whole purpose of the platform is to reduce the transaction costs, I've said that already. And uh, the interesting thing of, um, of creating this critical mass is through pricing models or incentive models that in this case can be even imbalanced. So not everybody that profits pays for it. There are also incentives to keep or to bring in people uh, on one side of the multi-sided platform to satisfy what happens on the other side of the multi-sided platform. Next one. All right, that leads um, to a number of challenges for demand responsive transport and driverless demand responsive transport in the future. Um, problems that you all will find as hot topics in current research, and I don't claim that I'm the only one working in this space, that there, there are plenty of people and plenty of institutions in Australia and worldwide looking at routing problems. What is the optimal allocation of vehicles to the transport demand? Um, should we look only at the currently known transport demand? That means those um, that have already registered on the platform there their needs or should we also learn from patterns over time and anticipate demand? That is an interesting question for uh, relocation of vehicles um, as well. The real-time planning aspect, um, if a new 
passenger or client um, calls up and wants to have a ride, um, there need to be some vehicles changing their plans. That means renegotiating renegotiating the contracts with the passengers on board already. That is a critical thing if they also give service guarantees um, for delivering people not beyond certain detoured times, etc. Um, pricing, I mentioned that already. Pricing has an influence on the multi-sided balance in the business and uh, pricing needs to be dynamic in that context and we don't know yet how to model that uh, very well. Uh, economies of scale here, uh, we want to attract customers. Uh, we also need to increase then our fleet sizes, who invests first, who tries, who stays with the system even if it is not yet operating optimally uh, to the individual needs. And there's a trust and satisfaction issue with it. I mentioned that already before, but it is an issue for research. So it's a challenge, um, something that we haven't solved yet in a satisfactory manner. All right, next slide. So that was all one aspect, a little focus of my talk that I intend to give at the summit. And I hope I have made you curious and we'll see you again at the summit. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, Stefan. That was very, very um, interesting. You raised many interesting points, um, you know, being being generated with throughout your webinar presentation, uh, such as when critical mass is uh, being accepted and also the cost. We've actually received quite a uh, few questions, and I actually just maybe at this point ask um, one of those questions. Um, how do you think the Australian public will interact and react with uh, driverless vehicles, especially with what you mentioned about driverless demand response um, transport. Um, and which of these generations do you think are more acceptable to those changes? Yeah, that is an interesting question. Um, as, I, as I said, looking into the future is in, in times of disruptions, not straightforward. Um, there's part of education and part of immediate benefits that influence uh, people's reaction or the, the public uptake of modes. So it's, it's foreseeable, for example, that um, specialized services will designed to help and operate for small groups of the public that have not much choice uh, that are disadvantaged currently already. I'm thinking here of the elderly, or I'm thinking of uh, those young people that are living in the suburbs and have issues with access and uh, have not yet a driver's license. So th there are segments of the public that will probably take it up because they need it. Um, then there is the greater portion of the public that gets offers and that can make choices that has alternatives and for them it remains to be seen <laughs> how happy they are. Um, we know that people are not completely rational with their choice of uh, modes, they are sticking with their private vehicles, um, although that is the most expensive form of moving in the city. How we lure them out of their privately owned vehicles is a challenge, uh, currently already. It will be, become stronger, or the argument, the economic argument will become a stronger one once we have the driverless vehicle. So. Sharing is not everybody's taste. Um, the convenience of the private vehicle and the privacy of the private vehicle um, are highly valued. And uh, it, the, the new driverless world needs to provide strong incentives to lure people away. Hmm. Now, thanks for that, Stefan. Um, I guess I can take one more, I'll take one more question uh, before we move on to, to the next presentation. Um, one of the questions we've got here is that with the increasing transition between um, current public transport or the current traditional public transport to the more automation, um, the question is um, 
how do we think that that will that new technology will be replacing um, jobs and what type of economic um, studies or research have we done be behind this change all right thank you the the job question is an interesting one. So our job market, and that is not limited to driverless or autonomously operating vehicles. It is um, generally a challenge for an economy where more and more tasks are taken up by um, artificial intelligence, by robots, by um, machines. Um, there, there is a replacement of certain types of jobs and on the other hand there is of course the creation of other jobs happening um, not necessarily in balance so um, there will be winners and losers and what we urgently need as a society is a is a discussion how we distribute the wealth that is created by automation in a fair way that everybody has a life in Australia and a perspective in Australia. That is a very general answer to your very specific question. Now, with regard to public transport and the loss of work here, you are probably thinking of the drivers of buses, trains and trams. Um, yes, they may lose their work in this, in this game, but there will be other jobs created um, in the sector that runs the platforms in the sector that tries to improve the flexibility and the demand response times and the economic aspects of the creating that critical mass and uh, and growth of of the sector so there, there there are other jobs created and we hope um, jobs of higher value Mm, no, good, good um, response. Thanks for that, Stefan. Um, we have got many, many more questions coming in, but um, um, in the interest, what I'll do is, um, if we get time towards the end of the um, Professor Rocco's presentation, we'll take more questions. So, without further delay, um, I'd like to invite uh, and welcome Professor Rocco Zito to share with us about activities of connected and automated vehicle, as and his presentation is titled "Autonomous Vehicle Modeling." Thanks, uh, Rocco. Uh, thanks, Dick Dixon. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, where I thought I'd start is um, uh, just to describe the transport modelling framework. Um, we've been transport modelling since the early 50s, so we're quite mature in this, um, uh, in this aspect. Um, and there are several different layers of, mo of models that, uh, that currently um, researchers uh, 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 and all sorts of governments and, and the private sector are using. Stretching from macro, uh, uh, macroscopic uh, level models um, that can that can cover entire countries um, or uh, metropolitan areas. Um, they're really quite um, uh, strategic level modellings. Uh, all departments of transport uh, would have a macros macroscopic model of their network on hand, and that and that type of modelling allows them to uh, to make informed choices about investment infrastructure. Mesoscopic uh, uh, level modelling, um, as by the diagram, is the is the next level down, where um, um, instead of those uh, st strategic roads, uh, all of a sudden you, you're going down to link levels, and you and you're looking at uh, uh, individual links uh, within a network. Uh, the networks are usually um, uh, a bit smaller um, and only based around uh, 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 metropolitan areas or local government areas. Microscopic is where we start to um, uh, really hone down um, and uh, look at the individual vehicles and how the individual vehicles are are interacting with each other while they uh, traverse the uh, the road network. These road networks geographically are usually a lot smaller. Uh, they might be a, a small CBD area or a road corridor. We also have. Um, Hybrid simulation. Uh, their uh, their uh, microscopic uh, models are quite data hungry. Mesoscopic, not so much. So um, another popular uh, layer of uh, 
transport modeling has been hybrid where the two emerge so um, uh, you still get the level of, uh, you still get some of the level of detail of my of microscopic modeling um, uh, but then you have the advantages of not having to uh, maintain and update as much data so if we go to the next slide um, uh, just further em emphasizing this uh, you can see up the top right there when we're looking at individual vehicles, individual lanes um, and lane segments. That's really the micro simulation uh, 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 models that, that are being used. SIDRA, uh, a very popular uh, uh, intersection uh, optimization tool, um, looks at individual dot drive cycles at that, at that lane le uh, level. Um, but if we, if we have a look in the bottom left-hand uh, corner, most transport planning and economic analysis usually happens at that strategic level um, and uh, uses specific speed flow functions for the different road types um, and uh, doesn't look at in individual lanes or road uh, but approaches to an area. Um, so, uh, and you can see on the ax uh, on the axes how we go to increasing levels of road geometry um, and traffic data. So this is where we are now. Um, and to give you a bit of a, uh, a visualization, um, here in Adelaide we run MASTEM, the Metropolitan Adelaide Strategic Transport Evaluation Model. Um, it's a cube model, uh, one of the popular pieces of software that's running. Um, uh, uh, that those macro uh, scopic models are running. Uh, we also ha uh, we also run. Um, uh, my research team has built um, micro simulation models of um, um, uh, sorry uh, uh, meso uh, scale models of uh, the Adelaide CVD and beyond. And you can see there in the bottom graphic that uh, we're really uh, looking at uh, the link level um, in in mesoscopic model models and how well. Uh, those uh, those individual links are performing. If we go uh, push the button again, if we have a look at so micro simulation uh, uh, modeling, um, and perhaps there might be a video that that will run. If we click on the uh, uh, on the on the road, uh, the blue dots represent the individual vehicles, and you can actually see them traversing down the lane. Um, and uh, with the AIMSUM package that we use, you can actually have a driver's eye view uh, of what uh, uh, the vehicle is doing and how it's interacting with the road network. Um, and the red box just represents that that hybrid uh, simulation um, uh, modeling, which is the, the integration of the meso and the micro. Um, so that's probably given you a bit of an overview of where we are now. Uh, we're very mature in transport modeling. Um, so the next step now is to have a look at driverless vehicles and how are these new technology vehicles, um, these new attributes associated with autonomous vehicles now going to be integrated into um, uh, these traditional types of transport models uh, that we have. And I, and I think really uh, uh, the best way to do that is um, Stefan mentioned before the trials that are being uh, conducted uh, around the country and around the world and we need to use these trials to uh, feed information into these uh, 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 trans uh, into all these levels of transport modeling um, so the trial that um, I'm going to be running is that is at the uh, uh, Tonsley um, Innovation Precinct in Adelaide. Um, it's actually where our um, uh, uh, Flinders at Tonsley uh, campus is, where all our engineering courses uh, are run. And you can see on the um, uh, on the western side uh, we have the Clovelly Park train station um, and on the uh, eastern side we have uh, South Road and the bus stops on South Road. So they're two mass transit line hall uh, public transport operations that are um, uh, feeding the site on the eastern eastern and western sides. And they're, and they're about, um, the train station in South Road is about 1.5 uh, uh, kilometers apart. So the, the red uh, uh, the red lines represent the proposed route that we want our uh, driverless shuttle uh, shuttle bus uh, to be doing uh, so that it can bring people in 
from South Road, but mainly concentrating on the train station because that's uh, uh, we've done the counts and that's where most of the people are coming in from, um, and link link them into uh, the uh, Tonsley Innovation Precinct. Not not only the students at at, at Flinders, you can see that here at Tonsley, um, there's going to be a, a residential development, 650 homes, so we could be providing. Um, uh, a service for, for those people, as well as the other industries uh, that are at uh, Tonsley, including uh, Mitsubishi Motors head office, uh, Siemens. Uh, they they run a um, uh, a motor uh, high voltage motor uh, uh, repair factory there. TAFE SA uh, is also located at uh, um, uh, Tonsley as well. So, we're, uh, and we're hoping to start this trial uh, quarter one next year um, and when we get the uh, the shuttle uh, we've chosen Navia at the moment as our, our uh, provider so when we get that shuttle and commission the route um, we'll be uh, getting data uh, uh, from the shuttle um, patronage as well as the um, the vehicle dynamics and feeding those um, into uh, all those different levels uh, of modeling that we have next slide please Next slide. So, um, uh, because this has been brewing for a while, we actually have um, um, we've actually created uh, always looking to the future um, a nano simulation. So, th this is probably one of the, one of the newest um, uh, transport modelling tools uh, going around. Whereas uh, b uh, before, the, the models were very analytical um, and and concentrated on. Um, uh, the vehicles and their interaction with the road system. Nano simulation um, actually looks at individual people and their mobility requirements. Um, so uh, you just saw that uh, some people getting off the train station at, at Cloverley Park. Now they're walking to the uh, autonomous bus stop. Um, uh, there they are, those two white shelters um, uh, that they're walking to, and they're going to uh, wait for that green uh, and that green. Um, uh, bus or, sh or shuttle bus is the autonomous vehicle that, that they're going to be waiting for. Um, you might be ma uh, able to, uh, to make out that uh, two, two passengers just boarded the bus um, and the others uh, uh, chose to walk. Uh, so again, th that elasticity around depending on where, where, the, where a person actually needs to go um, and their um, uh, and their willingness uh, to use uh, public public transport and or autonomous transport, all those elasticities have to be uh, fed into the um, uh, the nano simulation model. Um, so now we've come to the uh, the next stop, um, and we've got a whole bunch of people in. And for, for this shuttle bus, it's got a capacity of ten, and it's full uh, now, um, and it's going to uh, now it's driving autonomously. to then trying to get a working model of how our shuttle will actually run along our route um, and uh, pick up and drop off people. So we just had five people uh, get off and walk to their destinations. Um, so th that's some uh, uh, rule modeling that we've done. If we, um, seeing the people walk off, if we can go to the next slide. So um, there's a number number of uh, mode choice um, uh, parameters that we had to feed into that um, uh, that nano simulation uh, modelling, and the first few are really based around the, the traveller. Again, nano nano simulation doesn't really um, uh, concentrate on the vehicle. Um, it it it, uh, it really wants to know uh, about the traveller, uh, their preferences. Uh, have they got the ability to drive, walk, ride, take a taxi, cycle? So all all of that. Uh, this is the dialogue box that we've used to enter all those um, uh, mode choice preferences of each individual traveller. If we go to the next slide. Uh, we go from uh, uh, mode choice to uh, driving parameters uh, for the tra uh, the travellers, so we can um, see um, uh, what the different uh, walking uh, uh, the headways, reaction times, safety margins, uh, 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 lane gap, uh, and the like. Um, so you can see that, um, and for all the different modes as well. 
pick up, walk plus drive, um, many, many different uh, combinations. Um, so a really data hungry model, uh, but the data really is coming from uh, uh, the people themselves. If we go to the next slide, more input, uh, there are more input parameters uh, about costs now. Um, so with all those different modes of travel, we can assign costs um, and that includes costs of, of using normal public transport or autonomous public transport as a uh, feeder service to, uh, to line, line haul. And we can use cost elasticities to, to, uh, to estimate people's willingness um, uh, to use these different modes. Next slide. Um, now we get on to uh, the, uh, this is where we, um, uh, for the different modes, uh, you can see uh, uh, driverless, uh, we're setting the costs in our model, the costs are free, so we're going to be providing a free service for our trial at Tonsley. Um, and then Next slide. So now is um, uh, uh, in this set of input parameters is where we look at the different vehicle types, their their descriptors and their their shapes. So we actually assign um, uh, just back one slide. Uh, so we actually assigned uh, different colours to the different modes of uh, transport. That was that one. Sorry. Uh, next slide. Um, and, and here is where we st start to look at the physical parameters, length, uh, width, height, mass, um, size variation, um, uh, the, the capacity um, uh, of, of the different modes, uh, whether uh, sitting or standing. So I think the next slide goes on to uh, talk more about um, the uh, 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 back one. Yep. So, uh, so the traditional traffic uh, for the, again for the different modes, including driverless, uh, tire friction, different gap factors, uh, conflict factors, uh, and stuff. And at the moment, these are just um, being input as our best guess. Um, next slide. Uh, stop and dwell time, so at each stop, uh, uh, so uh, ha how long um, uh, does it usually take uh, uh, people to uh, uh, board or alight uh, the vehicle, so all that sort of stuff uh, has to be set as well. Um, next slide. So it's... Um, Nano simulation modeling um, is really data hungry. Um, uh, you need to f uh, feed it very detailed data at the moment. Um, we're putting in our best guesses uh, from the uh, uh, literature and our modeling experience. Once the trial starts, um, we'll be uh, logging our autonomous shuttle uh, and we'll also be surveying uh, the people uh, on board to have a look at their willingness to travel on these uh, on this new time of uh, te uh, technology. Um, so once we run the model and we're, we're happy that we can, um, uh, that we've got enough input data that allows us to uh, not only uh, calibrate uh, the, the model, but, but actually validate it using real world data. Um, so once we're happy that uh, uh, our model is a good reflection of what's happening in the real world, we can then um, uh, in the simulation run many, many different uh, types of uh, uh, reports um, that, gives, uh, that gives us different uh, uh, measures of uh, completed trip distance, uh, trip time, um, how many people uh, missed the bus uh, so they were incomplete. So there's just, uh, because it's uh, in a simulation model now, um, we have access to all the, uh, all the data we want uh, and more and can uh, uh, run those reports. And I suppose the real advantage of uh, the modelling um, is that we can make changes. 
So what uh, uh, and run many, many different uh, uh, sorts of what if uh, scenarios and compare them to a base case. Um, so what happens if we change the route? What happens if we start uh, putting different pricing regimes on uh, uh, autonomous uh, uh, vehicle driving? What happens if we increase the, the differentiator between um, uh, private vehicles, mass transit and autonom autonomous uh, transit? How are people going to react to that? And it's the surveys and the, the onboard data that we uh, collect that will help feed, the, uh, feed those models. So next slide. So how I wanted to con conclude was really the amount of data or not uh, uh, with my engineers hat on um, the, the amount of fine detailed data that we can collect on autonomous uh, uh, vehicles um, is really quite massive um, these vehicles are using uh, GPS technology uh, light uh, lidar technology that's giving uh, giving back point clouds um, they constantly measuring using LIDAR and ultrasonics and a whole bunch of other technology. They're constantly measuring the distance between the vehicle and an, obst and a, and an obstacle in front, which could be another vehicle or, or a pedestrian and stuff. So there's a, uh, there's a huge amount of data that we can collect. But um, it really does depend on the level of modeling and the, and the questions you want uh, you want answered um, uh, uh, will detail what data you need to collect um, how you need to analyze it and and what's the most appropriate way to feed it into that um, transport model in the modeling I think um, with all the data that we we're uh, collecting the biggest impacts going to be at that micro and nano level um, uh, modeling I think at th that that strategic level um, the platooning and, all, and automation will probably get uh, uh, of autonomous vehicles might get lost um, in the other vehicles, but you could put some um, uh, efficiency increases, uh, smaller headways uh, for those types of vehicles. Um, but again, you need those real world trials to try and get that uh, uh, data from. And that was my uh, next point is that collecting data from all the trials that are happen happen happening around the country um, are going to be key to the validation and calibration requirements of these types of models uh, so we can get sensible um, uh, data out of it. Um, so managing the, the uh, uh, managing uh, uh, the, uh, the huge magnitude of data that we need to get from these new types of vehicles to produce good modelling information really is the key. Thanks, Tinkson. Thanks for that, Rocco. Thank you for your uh, insights into um, data modelling. Um, we've got lots and lots and lots of <laughs> questions that's coming rolling in. Um, so I'll. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got some time. So what I'll do is probably start with um, some questions uh, directed for yourself, uh, Rocco. Um, yep. One question is: um, Are there any studies or guidance for road authorities in regards to additional infrastructure with the implementation of connected and automated vehicles, based on some of those modeling that you've done? Uh, not on the modeling. The Most of the time, hasn't um, uh, we haven't had the time yet to feed that back into road authorities? But road authorities are very w well aware that um, autonomous vehicles are coming. Coming, how do they need to manage them? How, how, do, how does a road authority need to manage these autonomous vehicles that are going to be driving on their road network? Um, and again, that's another aspect of the trials where where we'll. Where for my trial, we're working very closely with with the with DIPT, our Department of Transport here in South Australia, to look at uh, what the infrastructure requirements, what the communication requirements are to get these uh, vehicles safely on the road and providing a better level 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 of service than we have at the moment. Yes, Rogo, and I guess that's exactly the point that with all these activities, you know, all the proof of concepts and all the trials will generate basically all the um, findings um, in order for the uh, road authorities to have a better understanding of what's needed in their infrastructure. So thanks for that. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, just in terms of another question, um, with the amount of data that you mentioned, um, the data analysis and you know all the information that's being collected for modeling and what have you, um, once all these data are being generated and, and, and being, being used for the trials, but how do you see 
all this vast amount of data, um, uh, once it's become moved from a, a proof of concept or trial phase to become commercially available, do you see using a third party stacks or how do you think we should be able to store and handle all this amount of data? Good question. Um, storing and using the data. Well, if, if we look at, I, th I think it's going to be up to, um, I think there's going to be new business opportunities uh, emerging from this highly detailed data. We've, we, um, and I'll use the analogy of <coughs> here in <coughs> South Australia, we have the um, Ad Insight Network of Bluetooth detectors. So masses and masses of, of Bluetooth data being uh, being collected, analysed in real time, um, and then being made available to the public for um, uh, trip guidance. Uh, so they can actually use uh, <clears throat> real time traffic information uh, for for real time routing. And that's where I see this going. I mean. Um, the, uh, Third parties will come in, get access to the data somehow. Um, I'll use a keyword cloud, uh, perhaps. Um, but getting access to the data is only, is only the start. Um, it will be what algorithms, how are, how are we going to actually analyse the data so we can actually get some useful traffic information. Um, and uh, so I think uh, the data that autonomous vehicles uh, are, are producing uh, will be another data set that uh, um, uh, users uh, will be able to tap into to get to get an even better idea of how the uh, uh, the road networks performing. No, thanks for that, Rocco. Um, looking through some of these, <laughs> we we're getting a lot of <laughs> the many, many, many questions coming from uh, our participants. So it's really, really good to see. Can, can um, I advise? Uh, so uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Dixon, but I knew this. Uh, this always, whenever I speak, it raises a lot of questions and stuff. And I think um, if people get a chance to come down to the Advi conference, um, uh, I know I've got a panel session with uh, with Stefan. Uh, we're both going to be around. Very approachable. Very happy to um, uh, take questions from uh, 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 from people um, uh, uh, and um, uh, provide them as much information as we uh, uh, as we can. I think it's going to be a really useful. Um, uh, uh, conference uh, to get to get a lot of the um, uh, real up and coming uh, knowledge uh, on autonomous vehicles where they are in the country and in, internationally as well. Yeah. No, so if I don't answer all your questions now, don't. don't yeah. Worry. No, exactly. So we can only um, you know have a few questions in terms of um, this um, time that we've been given. There is a question that um, maybe I will ask that to uh, Stefan. Um, in terms of uh, with all these. Um, make split and changes from, from um, traditional you know, driver or human driver um, um, vehicle to the driverless vehicle. How do you think that integration of such technology, especially in years to come where people may still want to drive vehicle leisurely, um, how do you think that could fit in into this mixed fleet environment? And do you think that there will be a safety uh, uh, concern with a mixed fleet? <laughs> There's another question asking for the for the disrupted future. Um, <laughs> the the risk in traffic will be the human-driven vehicle. Um, the other ones have a let's say calculated behavior and are communicating with each other. The human driver is not communicating with the driverless vehicles so well um, or using other channels like uh, uh, visual signals but th th there's no real-time coordinated driving with a human driver possible and I mentioned the risks of humans behind the steering wheel before so from a safety perspective uh, the human driven vehicle will become the risk in traffic that is in its majority being operated driverless. It's possible that we don't mix the two forms of transport for a while at least. Um, and what these people have to do for being allowed to drive for their leisure is they have to pay for it. Uh, that's a good point. Thanks for that. Um, we've got many, many questions regarding rural and regional Australia. So actually, I'll try and um, sum some of those questions up into a question. 
Um, with this technology of automated and connected vehicle, how do you think Australia, being quite vastly um, required in terms of the regional Australia, would they be able to access this technology? And how do you see the time frame of this technology being introduced into regional and uh, rural Australia? Mm -hmm. oh, oh. Sorry. Um, Go ahead, either one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I can have a go at this question and stuff. I think um, I th the regional rural, rural areas in Australia is, I think, one of the big points of difference Australia has compared to the, uh, to the rest of the world in terms of autonomous vehicles. Um, we have um, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of kilometres of uh, roads um, in rural and and regional areas, and the large proportion of those roads are, are um, dual lane, um, unlike uh, uh, a lot of the road network in, in the US or Europe. So this is going to propose, propose a uni unique issue to uh, truck platooning. So these, uh, when we get to the stage of running autonomous articulated vehicles between capital cities, um, how are they going to plat uh, platoon on these si single roads and how are they going to allow, allow um, uh, the normal vehicles, the private vehicles to, to overtake them and stuff. Um, and that's where some, I know uh, Western Australia is uh, leading the way in their trials of autonomous um, uh, uh, freight vehicles, uh, the uh, long haul semi-trailers uh, in regional areas and using more advanced technologies to split up the, the uh, platoon and then re reconnect it uh, after a uh, passenger vehicle has done all its overtaking uh, uh, manoeuvres. This is really unique to Australia and I think uh, uh, w w one of the rich areas for, for research. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Rocco. It's a very, very good point. Did you have anything to add, Stefan? Yeah, I would agree with Rocco that it is a unique environment with opportunities. Um, so the significantly lower uh, amount of traffic on the road in rural areas, uh, the hundreds of kilometers that you can drive alone, um, sometimes, <laughs> are, are, are tempting to, um, to be delegated to a driverless vehicle. So I, I think there are even bigger opportunities and earlier opportunities for driverless vehicles in rural areas than it is in the inner city. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, you know, in terms of, of this question, it, it is something, and we've got many questions regarding safety as well. And I think both yourself, Stefan and Rocco brought up a good point with rural and regional Australia with, in terms of um, the safety aspects of it. Um, in the long haul. But in the interest of time, what I'll do is I'll encourage all those uh, questions and attendees to this webinar to take the opportunity to be um, at the at the summit and um, really ask those questions face to face to both Rocco and Stefan and all the other participants, uh, what do you call, um, participant uh, during that webinar. So in the interest of time, thank you gentlemen for your time. Um, and I'll pass back actually to Nila to um, summarise. Thanks, Nila. So yeah, I just I've left this slide up here. So just a reminder, um, we've got an exclusive offer today. Uh, you get a hundred dollars off your registration. You just type in the VIP. Stefan and Rocco, thank you so much for your time and all your insights. We very much appreciate uh, your presentations. Thanks, Now I hope to see everyone there at the um, summit. Great. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.